And let's begin. The Star by H.G. Wells It was on the first day of the new year that the announcement was made, almost simultaneously from three observatories, that the motion of the planet Neptune, the outermost of all the planets that wheel about the Sun, had become very erratic. Ogilvy had already called attention to a suspected retardation in its velocity in December. Such a piece of news was scarcely calculated to interest a world, the greater portion of whose inhabitants were unaware of the existence of the planet Neptune, nor outside the astronomical profession did the subsequent discovery of a faint remote speck of light in the region of the perturbed planet cause any very great excitement. Scientific people, however, found the intelligence remarkable enough, even before it became known by sorry, even before it became known that the new body was rapidly growing larger and brighter, that its motion was quite different from the orderly progress of the planets, and that the deflection of Neptune and its satellite was becoming now of an unprecedented kind. Few people without a training in science can realise the huge isolation of the solar system. The sun, with its specks of planets, its dust of planetoids, and impalpable comets, swims in a vacant immensity that almost defeats the imagination. Beyond the orbit of Neptune there is space, vacant so far as human observation has penetrated, without warmth or light, or sound, blank emptiness for twenty million times a million miles. That is the smallest estimate of the distance to be traversed before the very nearest of the stars is attained, and, saving a few comets more uns unsubstantial than the thinnest flame, no matter had ever to human knowledge crossed this gulf of space until early in the twentieth century this strange wanderer appeared. A vast mass of matter it was, bulky, heavy, rushing without warning out of the black mystery of the sky into the radiance of the sun. By the second day, it was clearly visible to any decent instrument as a speck with a barely sensible diameter in the constellation Leo near Regulus. In a little while, an opera glass could attain it. On the third day of the new year, the newspaper readers of two hemispheres were made aware for the first time of the real importance of this unusual apparition in the heavens. A planetary collision, one London paper headed the news, and proclaimed Duchesne's opinion that this strange new planet would probably collide with Neptune. The leader writers enlarged upon the topic so that in most of the capitals of the world, on January 3rd, there was an expectation, however vague, of some imminent phenomenon in the sky. And as the night followed the sunset round the globe, thousands of men turned their eyes skyward to see the old familiar stars, just as they had always been. Until it was dawn in London and Pollux, setting and the stars overhead grown pale, the winter's dawn it was, a sickly, filtering accumulation of daylight, and the light of gas and candles shone yellow in the windows to show where people were astir. But the yawning policemen saw the thing. The busy crowds in the markets stopped agape, workmen going to their work betimes, milkmen, the drivers of new carts, dissipation going home, jaded and pale, homeless wanderers, sentinels on their beats, and in the country, labourers trudging afield, poachers slinking home, all over the dusky, quickening country it could be seen, and out at sea by seamen watching for the day, a great white star come suddenly into the westward sky. Brighter it was than any star in our skies, brighter than the evening star at its brightest. It still glowed out white and large, no mere twinkling spot of light, but a small, round, clear, shining disk, an hour after the day had come. And where science has not reached, men stared and feared, telling one another of the wars and pestilences that are foreshadowed by these fiery signs in the heavens.' 
South Africans, Ghanaians, Frenchmen, Spaniards, Portuguese all stood in the warmth of the sunrise watching the setting of this strange new star. And in a hundred observatories there had been suppressed excitement, rising almost to shouting pitch as the two remote bodies had rushed together and a hurrying to and fro to gather photographic apparatus and spectroscope and this appliance and that to record this novel, astonishing sight, the destruction of a world. For it was a world, a sister planet of our Earth, far greater than our Earth indeed, that had so suddenly flashed into flaming death. Neptune, it was, had been struck, fairly and squarely, by the strange planet from outer space, and the heat of the concussion had incontinently turned two solid globes into one vast mass of incandescence. Round the world that day, two hours before the dawn, went the pallid great white star, fading only as it sank westward and the sun mounted above it. Everywhere men marvelled at it, but of all those who saw it none could have marvelled more than those sailors habitual watchers of the stars, who, far away at sea, had heard nothing of its advent, and saw it now rise like a pygmy moon and climb zenithward and hang overhead and sink westward with the passing of the night. And when next it rose over Europe everywhere were crowds of watchers on hilly slopes, on house roofs, in open spaces, staring eastward for the rising of the great new star. It rose with a white glow in front of it, like the glare of a white fire, and those who had seen it come into existence the night before cried out at the sight of it. It is larger, they cried, it is brighter. And indeed the moon, a quarter full and sinking in the west, was in its apparent size beyond comparison, but scarcely in all its breadth had it as much brightness now as the little circle of the strange new star. It is brighter, cried the people clustering in the streets, but in the dim observatories the watchers held their breath and peered at one another. It is nearer, they said, nearer. And voice after voice repeated, it is nearer. And the clicking telegraph took that up, and it trembled along telephone wires, and in a thousand cities grimy compositors fingered the type, it is nearer. Men, writing in offices, struck with a strange realisation flung down their pens. Men talking in a thousand places suddenly came upon a grotesque possibility in those words. It is nearer. It hurried along wakening streets. It was shouted down the frost-stilled ways of quiet villages. Men who had read these things from the throbbing tapes stood in yellow-lit doorways shouting the news to the passers-by. It is nearer. Pretty women, flushed and glittering, heard the news told jestingly between the dances, and feigned an intelligent interest they did not feel. Nearer, indeed, how curious! How very, very clever people must be to find out things like that! Lonely tramps faring through the wintry night murmured those words to comfort themselves, looking skyward. It has need to be nearer, for the night's as cold as charity. Don't see much warmth from it if it is nearer all the same. "'What is a new star to me?' cried the weeping woman, kneeling beside her dead. A schoolboy, rising early for his examination work, puzzled it out for himself, with the great white star shining broad and bright through the frost flowers of his window. "'Centrifugal, centripetal,' he said, with his chin on his fist. "'Stop a planet in its flight, rob it of its centrifugal force. What then? Centripetal has it, and down it falls into the sun, and this... Do we come in the way, I wonder? The light of that day went the way of its brethren, and with the later watches of the frosty darkness rose the strange star again, and it was now so bright that the waxing moon seemed but a pale yellow ghost of itself, hanging huge in the sunset. In a South African city a great man had married, and the streets were alight to welcome his return with his bride. Even the skies have illuminated, said the flatterer. Under Capricorn, two lovers 
daring wild beasts and evil spirits, for love of one another, crouched together in a cane break where the fireflies hovered. That is our star, they whispered, and felt strangely comforted by the sweet brilliance of its light. The master mathematician sat in his private room and pushed the papers from him. His calculations were already finished. In a small white phial there still remained a little of the drug that had kept him awake and active for four long nights. Each day, serene, explicit, patient as ever, he had given his lecture to his students, and then had come back at once to this momentous calculation. His face was grave, a little drawn and hectic from his drugged activity. For some time he seemed lost in thought. Then he went to the window, and the blind went up with a click. Halfway up the sky, over the clustering roofs, chimneys and steeples of the city, hung the star. He looked at it as one might look into the eyes of a brave enemy. "'You may kill me,' he said after a silence, "'but I can hold you, and all the universe for that matter, in the grip of this little brain. I would not change.' even now. He looked at the little phial. There will be no need to sleep again, he said. The next day, at noon, punctual to the minute, he entered his lecture theatre, put his hat on the end of the table, as his habit was, and carefully selected a large piece of chalk. It was a joke among his students that he could not lecture without that piece of chalk to fumble in his fingers, and once he had been stricken to impotence by their hiding his supply. He came and looked under his grey eyebrows at the rising tears of young, fresh faces, and spoke with his accustomed, studied commonness of phrasing. "'Circumstances have arisen. Circumstances beyond my control,' he said, and paused." which will debar me from completing the course I had designed. It would seem, gentlemen, if I may put the thing clearly and briefly, that man has lived in vain. The students glanced at one another. Had they heard this aright? Mad? Raised eyebrows and grinning lips there were, but one or two faces remained intent upon his calm, grey-fringed face. It'll be interesting he was saying, to devote this morning to an exposition, so far as I can make it clear to you, of the calculations that have led me to this conclusion. Let us assume, he turned towards the blackboard, meditating a diagram in a way that was usual to him. What was that about lived in vain? whispered one student to another. Listen, said the other, nodding towards the lecturer. And presently they began to understand. That night, the star rose later, for its proper eastward motion was carried, had carried it some way across Leo towards Virgo. Excuse me. And its brightness was so great that the sky became a luminous blue as it rose, and every star was hidden in its turn, save only Jupiter near the zenith, Capella, Aldebaran, Sirius, and the pointers of the bear. It was very white and beautiful. In many parts of the world that night a pallid halo encircled it about. It was perceptibly larger. In the clear, refractive sky of the top tropics, it seemed as if it were nearly a quarter the size of the moon. The frost was still on the ground in England, but the world was as brightly lit as if it were midsummer moonlight. One could see to read quite ordinary print by that cold, clear light, and in the cities the lamps burnt yellow and wan. And everywhere the world was awake that night, and throughout Christendom a sombre murmur hung in the keen air over the countryside, like the belling of bees in the heather, and this murmurous tumult grew to a clangour in the cities. It was the toiling of the bells in a million belfry towers and steeples, summoning the people to sleep no more, to sin no more, but to gather in their churches and pray. And overhead, growing larger and brighter as the earth rolled on its way and the night passed, rose the dazzling star. <laughs> 
and the streets and houses were alight in all the cities, the shipyards glared, and whatever roads led to high country were lit and crowded all night long. And in all the seas about the civilized lands, ships with throbbing engines and ships with bellying sails, crowded with men and living creatures, were standing out to ocean and the, and the north. For already the warning of the master mathematician had been telegraphed all over the world and translated into a hundred tongues. The new planet and Neptune, locks in a fiery embrace, were whirling headlong ever faster and faster towards the sun. Already every second this blazing mass flew a hundred miles and every second its terrific velocity increased. As it flew now, indeed, it must pass a hundred million of miles wide of the earth and scarcely affect it. But near its destined path, as yet only slightly perturbed, spun the mighty planet Jupiter, and his moons sweeping splendid round the sun. Every moment now the attraction between the fiery star and the greatest of the planets grew stronger. And the result of that attraction? Inevitably, Jupiter would be deflected from its orbit into an elliptical path, and the burning star, swung by his attraction wide of its sunward rush, would describe a curved path, and perhaps collide with, and certainly pass very close to, our Earth. Earthquakes, volcanic outbreaks, cyclones, sea waves, floods, and a steady rise in temperature to I know not what limit so prophesied the master mathematician. And overhead, to carry out his words, lonely and cold and livid, blazed the star of the coming doom. To many who stared at it that night until their eyes ached, it seemed that it was visibly approaching. And that night, too, the weather changed, and the frost that had gripped all central Europe and France and England softened towards a thaw. But you must not imagine, because I have spoken of people praying through the night, and people going aboard ships, and people fleeing towards the towards mountainous country, that the whole world was already in a terror. Because of the star. As a matter of fact, use and want still ruled the world, and save for the talk of idle moments and the splendour of the night, nine human beings out of ten were still busy at their common occupations. In all the cities, the shops, save one here and there, opened and closed at their proper hours. The doctor and the undertaker plied their trades, the workers gathered in the factories. Soldiers drilled, scholars studied, lovers sought one another, thieves lurked and fled. Politicians planned their schemes. The presses of the newspapers roared through the night, and many a priest of this church and that would not open his holy building to further what he considered a foolish panic. The newspapers insisted on their lesson of the year 1000, for then, too, people had anticipated the end. The star was no star, mere gas, a comet, and were it a star it could not possibly strike the earth. There was no precedent for such a thing. Common sense was sturdy everywhere, scornful, jesting, a little inclined to persecute the obdurate fearful. That night, at 7.15 by Greenwich time, the star would be at its nearest to Jupiter. Then the world would see the turn things would take. The master mathematician's grim warnings were treated by many as so much mere elaborate self-advertisement. -adver common sense at last, a little heated by argument, signified its unalterable conviction by going to bed. So, too, barbarism and savagery, already tired of the novelty, went about their nightly business, and save for a howling dog here and there, the beast world left the star unheeded. And yet, when at last the watchers in the European states saw the star rise an hour later, it is true, but no larger than it had been the night before, there was still plenty awake to laugh at the master mathematician, to take the danger as if it had passed. But hereafter the laughter ceased. The star grew. It grew with a terrible steadiness hour after hour, a little larger each hour, a little nearer the midnight zenith, and brighter and brighter, 
until it had turned night into a second day. Had it come straight to the earth instead of in a curved path, had it lost no velocity to Jupiter, it must have leapt the intervening gulf in a day. But as it was, it took five days altogether to come by our planet. The next night it had become a third the size of the moon before it set to English eyes, and the thaw was assured. It rose over America near the size of the moon, but blinding white to look at, and hot, and a breath of hot wind blew now with its rising and gathering strength, and in Virginia and Brazil and down the St. Lawrence Valley it shone intermittently through a driving reek of thunderclouds, flickering violet lightning, and hail unprecedented. In Manitoba was a thaw and devastating floods, and upon all the mountains of the earth the snow and ice began to melt that night, and all the rivers coming out of high country flowed thick and turbid, and soon, in their upper reaches, with swirling trees and the bodies of beasts and men. They rose steadily, steadily in the ghostly brilliance, and came trickling over their banks at last behind the flying population of their valleys. And along the coast of Argentina and up the South Atlantic the tides were higher than had ever been in the memory of man, and the storms drove the waters in many cases scores of miles inland, drowning whole cities. And so great grew the heat during the night that the rising of the sun was like the coming of a shadow. The earthquakes began and grew until all down America, from the Arctic Circle to Cape Horn, hillsides were sliding, fissures were opening, and houses and walls crumbling to destruction. The whole side of Cotop Cotopaxi slipped out in one vast convulsion, and a tumult of lava poured out so high and broad and swift and liquid that in one day it reached the sea. So the star, with the wan moon in its wake, marched across the Pacific, trailed the thunderstorms like the hem of a robe, and the growing tidal wave that toiled behind it, frothing and eager, poured over island and island and swept them clear of men. Until that, la until that wave came at last, in a blinding light, and with the breath of a furnace, swift and terrible it came, a wall of water fifty feet high, roaring hungrily upon the long coasts of Asia, and swept inland across the plains of China. For a space the star, hotter now and larger and brighter than the sun in its strength, showed with pitiless brilliance the wide and populous country, towns and villages with their pagodas and trees, roads, wide cultivated fields, millions of sleepless people staring in helpless terror at the incandescent sky. And then, low and growing, came the murmur of the flood. And thus it was with millions of men that night. A flight no whither, with limbs heavy, with heat and breath fierce and scant, and the flood like a wall swift and white behind, and then death. China was lit glowing white, but over Japan and Java and all the islands of eastern Asia the great star was a ball of dull red fire because of the steam and smoke and ashes the volcanoes were spouting forth to salute its coming. Above was the lava, hot gases and ash, and below the seething floods, and the whole earth swayed and rumbled with the earthquake shocks. Soon the immemorial snows of Tibet and the Himalaya were melting and pouring down by ten million deepening converging channels upon the plains of Burma and Hindustan. The tangled summits of the Indian jungles were aflame in a thousand places, and below the hurrying waters around the stems were dark objects that still struggled feebly and reflected the blood-red tongues of fire. And in a rudderless confusion a multitude of men and women fled down the broad riverways to that one last hope of men, the open sea. Larger grew the star, and larger, hotter, and brighter with a terrible swiftness now. The tropical ocean had lost its phosphorescence, and the whirling steam rose in ghostly wreaths from the black waves that plunged incessantly, speckled with storm-tossed ships. And then came a wonder. 
It seems to those who in Europe watch for the rising of the star that the world must have ceased its rotation. In a thousand open spaces of down and upland, the people who had fled thither from the floods and the falling houses and sliding slopes of hill watched for that rising in vain. Hour followed hour through a terrible suspense, and the star rose not. Once again, men set their eyes upon the old constellations they had counted lost to them forever. In England, it was hot and clear overhead, though the ground quivered perpetually, but in the tropics, Sirius and Capella and Aldebaran showed through a veil of steam. When at last the great star rose near ten hours late, the sun rose close upon it, and in the centre of its white heart was a disk of black. Over Asia, it was, the, it was the star had begun to fall behind the movement of the sky, and then suddenly, as it hung over India, its light had been veiled. All the plain of India, from the mouth of the Indus to the mouths of the Ganges, was a shallow waste of shining water that night out of which rose temples and palaces, mounds and hills, black with people. Every minaret was a clustering mass of people, who fell one by one into the turbid waters, as heat and terror overcame them. The whole land seemed a wailing, and suddenly there swept a shadow across the furnace of despair, and a breath of cold wind, and a gathering of clouds out of the cooling air, Men looking up, near blinded, at the star, saw that a black disc was creeping across the light. It was the moon, coming between the star and the earth. And even as men cried to God at this respite, out of the east, with a strange inexplicable swiftness, sprang the sun. And then star, sun, and moon rushed together across the heavens. So it was, that presently, to the European watchers, star and sun rose close upon each other, drove headlong for a space, and then slower, and at last came to rest. Star and sun merged into one glare of flame at the zenith of the sky. The moon no longer eclipsed the star, but was lost to sight in the brilliance of the sky. And though those who were still alive regarded it, for the most part, with that dull stupidity that hunger fatigue, heat, and despair engender, there were still men who could perceive the meaning of these signs. Star and earth had been at their nearest, had swung about one another, and the star had passed, or, sorry, the star had passed. Already it was receding, swifter and swifter in the last stage of its headlong journey downward into the sun. And then the clouds gathered, blossing out the vision of the sky, the thunder and lightning wove a garment round the world. All over the earth was such a downpour of rain as men had never before seen, and where the volcanoes flared red against the cloud canopy there descended torrents of mud. Everywhere the waters were pouring off the land, leaving mud-silted ruins, and the earth littered like a storm-worn beach with all that had floated, and the dead bodies of the men and brutes, its children, for days the water streamed off the land, sweeping away soil and trees and houses in the, in the way, and piling huge dikes and scooping out titanic gullies over the countryside. Those were the days of darkness that followed the star and the heat. All through them, and for many weeks and months, the earthquakes continued. But the star had passed, and men hunger-driven and gathering courage only slowly, might creep back to their ruined cities, buried granaries and sodden fields. Such few ships as had escaped the storms of that time came stunned and shattered and sounding their way cautiously through the new marks and shoals of once familiar ports. And as the storms subsided, men perceived that everywhere the days were hotter than of yore, and the sun larger, and the moon shrunk to a third of its former size, took now fourscore days between its new and new. But of the new brotherhood that grew presently among men, 
of the saving of laws and books and machines, of the strange change that had come over Iceland and Greenland and the shores of Baffin's Bay, so that the sailors coming there presently found them green and gracious, and could scarce believe their eyes, this story does not tell. Nor of the movement of mankind now that the earth was hotter, northward and southward towards the poles of the earth, It concerns itself only with the coming and the passing of the star. The Martian astronomers, for there are astronomers on Mars, although they are very different beings from men, were naturally profoundly interested by these things. They saw them from their own standpoint, of course. Considering the mass and temperature of that missile that was flung through our solar system into the sun, one wrote, it is astonishing what a little damage the earth which it missed so narrowly has sustained all the familiar continental markings and the masses of the seas remain intact and indeed the only difference seems to be a shrinkage of the white discoloration supposed to be frozen water around either pole which only shows how small the vastest of human catastrophes may seem at a distance of a few million miles And that's the end of the star. Thank you. Um, so yeah, that's <laughs> that. That is. Yep, Wells back on his Martians. Yep. So that's uh, yeah, that's that. That's um. That was terrifying. Yeah, right. <laughs> Reading it then, I was like, he's he's gone on a lot. There was there was there was a lot going on here about the the inevitable destruction of the Earth. Uh, you could you could probably trim a couple of pages out, but uh, yeah, your, your man loves his detail about a star coming a little bit too close to Earth and just kind of torching everything. I'm just gonna have some water and then I will read like the next next one is divided into like chapters and stuff. So I'm just gonna quickly drink something and I'll be back in a second. Worry not. And I return. Yeah, space is scary. I, I, yeah, I, I did enjoy that one. It's, it's obviously, it's, it's bleak. Um, but just taking the very simple premise of, boy, we're small and vulnerable here, even though we don't think about it very often, is, um, is good. I like it. But yeah, uh, onto the next one, which say I'll, I will read some of, and then take a break to go and get some tea, and then continue in the second half. Uh, this is uh, it's 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 a different tone. It's by say it's by Voltaire. It's it's got a little bit more of a sense of humour. It's not quite so bleak. Uh, this is I'm just going to say it like this: Micromegas by Voltaire, Chapter One: Voyage of an Inhabitant of the Star Sirius to the Planet Saturn. On one of the planets that orbits the star named Sirius, there lived a spirited young man whom I had the honour of meeting on the last voyage he made to our little anthill. He was called Micromegas, a fitting name for anyone so great. He was eight leagues tall, 24,000 yards. Certain mathematicians, always of use to the public, will immediately take up their pens and calculate that, since Mr. Micromegas, inhabitant of the world of Sirius, is 24,000 yards tall, which is to say some paces of five feet each, and since we citizens of the Earth are hardly five feet tall, and our sphere 9,000 leagues around, they will find, I say, that it is absolutely necessary that the planet that produced him must be 21,600,000 times greater in circumference than our little Earth. Nothing in nature is simpler or more orderly. The sovereign states of Germany or Italy, which one can traverse in a half hour compared to the empires of Turkey, Moscow or China, are only feeble reflections of the prodigious differences that nature has placed in all beings.' 
His Excellency's size being as large as I have said, all our sculptors and all our painters will agree without protest that his belt must have been 50,000 feet in circumference, which gives him very good proportions. His nose taking up one third of his attractive face and his attractive face taking up one seventh of his attractive body, it must be admitted that the nose of the Syrian is 6,333 feet long, give or take, which is hard to ignore. As for his mind, well, it is one of the most cultivated that we have. He knows many things. He invented some of them. He was not even 250 years old when he studied, as is customary, at the most celebrated colleges of his planet, at which time he managed to figure out, by pure willpower, more than 50 of Euclid's propositions. That's 18 more than Blaise Pascal, who, after having figured out 32 just for fun, according to his sister's reports, later became a fairly mediocre mathematician and a very bad philosopher. Towards his 450th year, near the end of his infancy, he dissected many small insects, no more than 100 feet in diameter, which would evade ordinary microscopes. He wrote a very curious book about this, and it gave him some income. The Mufti of his country, an extremely ignorant warrior, found some suspicious, rash, disagreeable and heretical propositions in the book, smelled heresy and, pers and pursued it vigorously. It was a matter of finding out whether the substantial form of the fleas of Sirius were of the same nature as those of the snails. Micromegas gave a spirited defence. He brought in some women to testify in his favour. The trial lasted 220 years. Finally, the judge had the book condemned by Juris Consults, who had not read it, and the author was ordered to not appear in court for 800 years. He was thereby dealt the minor inconvenience of being banished from a court that, considered, that consisted of nothing but harassment and pettiness. He wrote an amusing song at the expense of the judge, which the latter hardly deigned to notice. Then he took up voyaging from planet to planet in order to develop his heart and mind, as the saying goes. Those that travel only by stagecoach or sedan chair will probably be surprised to learn of the carriage of this vessel, for we, on our little pile of mud, can conceive of only that to which we are accustomed. Our voyager was very unfamiliar with the laws of gravity and with all the other attractive and repulsive forces. He utilised them so well that, whether with the help of a ray of sunlight or some comet, he jumped from globe to globe like a bird hopping from branch to branch. He quickly spanned the Milky Way, and I am obliged to report that he never saw, throughout its constitutive stars, the beautiful Empyrean sky that the Reverend Mr. Deerham boasts of having seen at the other end of his telescope. I do not claim that Mr. Deerham has defective eyesight, God forbid, but Micromegas was actually there, and makes him a, and which makes him a reliable witness. Still, I do not want to contradict anyone. Micromegas, after having toured around, arrived at the planet Saturn. As accustomed as he was to seeing new things, he could not, upon seeing the smallness of the planet and its inhabitants, stop himself from smiling with the superiority, and occasionally betrays sorry that occasionally betrays even the worst wisest of us. For, in the end, Saturn is hardly nine times bigger than Earth, and the citizens of this world are dwarfs, no more than a thousand fathoms tall or thereabouts. He and his men poked fun at them at first, like Italian musicians laughing at the music of Lully when he comes to France. But, as the Syrian had a good heart, he understood very quickly that a thinking being is not necessarily ridiculous just because he is only six thousand feet tall. He got to know the Saturnians, once their initial shock had worn off. Indeed, he cultivated a strong friendship with the secretary of the Academy of Saturn, a lively fellow who, though, to tell the truth, he had not invented anything, nonetheless understood the inventions of others very well, and who wrote some passable verses and carried out some complicated calculations. I will report here, for the reader's satisfaction, a singular conversation that Micromegas had with the secretary one day. Chapter 2. Conversation between the inhabitant of Sirius and that of Saturn. 
It was after His Excellency had laid himself down for a rest that the secretary approached him. "'You have to admit,' said Micromegas, "'nature is extremely varied.' "'Yes,' said the Saturnian. "'Nature is like a flower-bed in which the flowers—' "'Oh!' said the other. "'Don't talk to me about flower-beds.' The secretary began again. "'Nature is like a group of blonde and brunette girls whose jewellery—' "'What am I supposed to do with your brunettes?' returned the others. "'Perhaps we could say that nature is like an art gallery whose paintings—' "'None of that!' said the voyager. "'I will tell you. Nature is like nature. Why go searching after comparisons?' "'To please you,' replied the secretary. "'I do not want to be pleased.' answered the voyager. I want to be educated. Tell me how many senses of the men of your planet, sorry, tell me how many senses the men of your planet have. Only seventy-two, I'm afraid, said the academic. We're always complaining about it. Our capacity for imagination is much larger than it needs to be, frankly. We find that with our seventy-two senses, our planetary ring, our five moons, we are too restricted. And despite all our curiosity and the expansive range of enthusiasms that result from our seventy-two senses, we have plenty of time to get bored. I believe it, said Micromegas, for on our planet we have almost a thousand senses, and yet we are still aware of a sort of vague feeling, a kind of worry that warns us that there exists, somewhere, beings even more perfect than us. I have travelled a bit and have seen mortal creatures that surpass us. Some indeed are far superior, but I have not seen any that desire only what they truly need, and whose needs perfectly match their lives. Maybe some day I will happen upon a country that lacks for nothing, but so far as... Uh, so, excuse me. But so far no one has given me any word of a place like that. The Saturnian and the Syrian proceeded to wear themselves out in speculating, but after a loss of very ingenious and very doubtful imaginative extrapolation, they were compelled to return to cold hard facts. "'How long are your lifespans?' asked the Syrian. "'Ah, oh, we only live for a very short time,' replied the small man from Saturn. "'Same with us,' said the Syrian. "'We always complain about it. It must be a universal law of nature.' "'Alas, we only live through five hundred revolutions of our world around the sun,' said the Saturnian." This translates to roughly 15,000 earthly years. You can see yourself that this is to die almost at the moment one is born. Our existence is a mere point of... Sorry, our existence is a mere point. Our lifespan, an instant, our planet, an atom. Hardly do we begin to live, learn a little when death arrives, cutting us off before we have accumulated any experience. As for me, I don't dare make any plans. I see myself as a drop of water in an immense ocean. I am ashamed, especially when I meet someone as impressive as you, to consider what a ridiculous figure I make in this world. Micromegas replied, If you were not a philosopher, I would fear burdening you by telling you that our lifespan is seven hundred times longer than yours. Still, you know, of course, that when it is necessary to return your body to the elements, to reanimate nature in that alteration of form which we call death, when that moment of metamorphosis comes, you have lived an eternity, and to have lived a day amount sorry, to have lived an eternity, and to have lived a day amounts to precisely the same thing. I have been to worlds where folk live a thousand times longer than we do, but they still die and people everywhere have the good sense to know their role and give thanks to the author of nature. He has scattered across this universe a profusion of varieties of life, and done so with truly admirable uniformity. What I mean is, all the universe's thinking beings are different, yet all resemble one another in all possessing the gift of thought and desire. Matter is universal, but it has different properties on each planet. How many diverse properties do you count in yours? If you mean those properties, said the Saturnian, without which we believe that the planet could not subsist, we count three hundred of them. Things like extension, impenetrability, mobility, gravity, divisibility, and so on. Apparently, replied the voyager, this small number suffices for what the Creator planned for your dwelling place.' 
I admire his wisdom in everything. I see difference everywhere, but also proportion. Your planet is small. Your inhabitants are as well. You have few sensations. Your matter has few properties. All this is the work of providence. What colour is your sun? A rather yellowish white, said the Saturnian. When we apply a prism to its rays, we find that they contain seven colours. Our sun burns red, said the Syrian, and we have a spectrum of thirty-nine primary colours. There is no one sun among those that I have visited that resembles it, just as there is no one face among you that is identical to the others. After numerous questions of this nature, Micromegas discovered how many essentially different substances are found on Saturn. He learned there were only thirty or so, things like God, space, matter, the beings with extension that merely sense, the beings with extension that sense and think, the thinking beings that have no extension, those that are penetrable, those that are not, all these kinds of things. The Syrian, whose home consist contained 300 and who had discovered 3,000 more on his voyages, prodigiously surprised the philosopher of Saturn by telling him so. Finally, after having exchanged knowledge, a little of what they sorry, a little of what they knew and a lot of what they did not know, and after having debated and discussed during the course of a complete revolution around the sun, they resolved to go on a small philosophical voyage together. And that's the end of that chapter, and where I shall take the break for tonight. I feel like the second half is gonna be a little bit shorter, but that's okay. So yeah, gonna take a quick five minute break. Uh, do what you need to do, get up, stretch, cycle those fluids, um, make yourself comfy, and yeah, we'll see you back here in about five minutes. Thank you. <laughs> 
has had a successful break. I believe I have. I have acquired tea, which will probably still be largely intact by the end of this. Because, you know, that's the way things go sometimes. Fortunately, being the China Century Green Tea, it's actually still perfectly drinkable when cold. Because it's nice. But, uh, yeah. Just to catch my breath from like running up and down stairs a couple more times and anticipated, so uh, don't mind me. Alas, the entropy of the universe. Yeah, that's that's kind of tonight's lesson. Tonight's stream is a lovely background to me entering loads of songs into my mobile sheets on the tablet. Ah, right. Oh, making tea cold. Yeah, exactly. Just entropy doing its thing. Ooh, nice green jasmine tea. Lovely. Yeah, I did consider. I've got another one that I've, I've had a couple of times now. It's a sort of midnight. I think it's called like Midnight Meadow or something. It sounded nice when I got it, and it's not unpleasant, but it's a little bit too close to a uh, ginger and turmeric one that I have, which I've kind of I had too much of, and kind of put myself off. And so, while it's not unpleasant, it's it's too close to something that I'm. I've got overdone so uh, yeah but it's nice it's sort of peppermint and a whole bunch of other stuff and I think some ginger um, so the concept is good yeah right just wait 10 years I'll do that yeah yeah it's a shame don't mind the sound of stirring I do not wish to make this too strong mint your kryptonite you're not a fan of mint harpers I I don't go for mint tea that often, but it is nice. Oh, okay, <laughs> right. Mint mint will just get rid of you. Huh? I didn't realize. Yeah, it's it's one of those ones for me that like I I can kind of take or leave it unless I really want it, and then when I really want it, it's yeah. Oh, uh, you might the, the mint equivalent of the coriander thing. Ah, uh, love. I see. Yeah, so you love coriander. Yeah, no, I, I, I quite like coriander. I get that with like, I don't know. <laughs> hey Sam, how's your diet? Various green vegetables have like a really strong flavour in them that I sometimes have to work around. So I, I get where the coriander thing comes from, kind of what it's like. Um. Oh yeah, mintless toothpaste. Wow. Yeah. Good luck. Um, obviously, there are there are alternatives, but yeah, wow, well, yeah, that, that wow, fair enough. Anyway, we can talk more at the end of this, but for now, I have more story to get on with. As we return, I don't need to recap where we were last time. Just a very very large. I mean, Voltaire calls him a man being. I'm going to go with that from Sirius whose nose is 6,333 feet long um, is hanging out with a significantly smaller but still enormous being from Saturn and they've decided to go on a philosophical voyage together which we'll resume in chapter 3 Voyage of the Two Inhabitants of Sirius and Saturn our two philosophers were just ready to launch themselves into Saturn's atmosphere by means of a very nicely calibrated mathematical instrument when the ruler of Saturn, who had heard news of the departure, came weepingly to remonstrate. She was a pretty, petite, brown-haired girl, a mere 660 fathoms tall, though she compensated for her small stature with many other charms. Cruelty! she cried, after resisting you for 1,500 years, just when I was beginning to come around, when I'd spent hardly a hundred years in the embrace of your arms, you abandoned me to go on a voyage with a giant from another world. Go on, then. You're only curious. You've never been in love. If you were a true Saturnian, you'd be faithful. Where are you running off to, anyway? What do you even want? Oh, our five moons are less wayward than you, our ring less inconsistent. It's over. I will never love anyone again. The philosopher embraced her and wept with her. He was a philosopher after all. The woman, after striking dramatic attitudes, went off to console herself with the help of one of the dandies of the country. 
So our two explorers departed. They alighted first on Saturn's ring, which they found to be fairly flat, as conjectured by an illustrious inhabitant of our little sphere. From there they moved easily from moon to moon. When a comet passed by the last of these, they grabbed onto it and flew on it, along with their servants and their scientific instruments. After they had travelled approximately 150 million leagues, they rendezvoused with the satellites of Jupiter. They stopped at Jupiter and stayed for a week, during which time they learned some very wonderful secrets that I would furnish here in print, if it were not for the Inquisition, which found some of the propositions to be a little harsh. But I have read the manuscript in the library of the illustrious Archbishop of Redacted, who, with a generosity and goodness that is impossible to overpraise, allowed me to consult his books. I promised him a long article in the first edition of Moreri, and I will not forget his children, who give such a great hope of perpetuating the race of their illustrious father. But let us now return to our travellers. Upon leaving Jupiter, they traversed a distance of some 100 million leagues, and so approached the planet Mars, which, as we know, is five times smaller than our own. They swung by the two moons that attended upon this world, but which have escaped the notice of our astronomers. I know very well that Father Castell will write, perhaps even politely, against the existence of these two moons. Still, I rely on those who reason by analogy. These good philosophers know how unlikely it would be for Mars, so far from the Sun, to have gotten by with fewer than two moons. Whatever the case may be, our explorers found this world so small that they feared they would not be able to land upon it, and so they passed it by like two travellers, disdainful of a bad village inn, pressing on instead towards a neighbouring city. But the Syrian and his companions soon regretted it. They travelled a long time without finding anything, until, finally, they perceived a tiny candle. It was the earth. But... What a pitiful sight it was to those who had so recently left Jupiter. Nevertheless, from fear of further regret, they resolved to touch down. Carried by the tail of a comet, and transferring to a convenient Aurora, Borei, uh, uh, Aurora Borealis, they started towards it and landed upon the Earth on the northern coast of the Baltic Sea on the 5th of July, 1737, New Style. Chapter 4. What Happened on Planet Earth After resting for a while, they ate two mountains for lunch, which their servants prepared pretty nicely for them. Then they decided to familiarise themselves with the small land into which they had arrived. They travelled first north to south. The usual stride of the Syrian and his attendants was approximately 30,000 feet. The dwarf from Saturn, with his mere thousand fathoms of height, trailed behind, gasping heavily. He had to make twelve steps to each of his other's strides. Imagine, if such a comparison is not too impertinent, a very small lapdog following a captain of the guards of the Prussian king. The speed at which our strangers moved meant they, that, now, that they circumnavigated the globe in thirty-six hours. The sun of course, or rather the Earth, makes a similar voyage in a day. But you have to imagine that the going is much easier when one turns on one's axis instead of walking on one's feet. So there they were, back where they started, after having seen the barely noticeable pond we call the Mediterranean, and another little pool that, under the name Ocean, encircles the molehill. The dwarf never got wet over his knees, and the other hardly splashed his heels. On their way, they took pains to try and determine whether the planet was inhabited or not. They crouched, lay down, felt around everywhere, but their eyes and their hands were not proportionate to the little beings that crawl in this place. They could not feel in the least any sensation that might lead them to suspect that we and our fellows, and other inhabitants of this planet, have the honour of existing. The dwarf, who was a little prone to hastiness, decided immediately that the planet was uninhabited. He reasoned that he had not seen anyone. Micromegas politely suggested to him that this logic was rather flawed. For, said he, you do not see with your little eyes certain stars of the fiftieth magnitude that I can perceive very distinctly. 
do conclude these stars do not exist. But, said the dwarf, I had a pretty good feel, too. But, answered the other, you have pretty feeble senses. But, replied the dwarf, this planet is poorly constructed. It is so irregular and has such a ridiculous shape. Everything here seems to be in chaos. You see, these little rivulets, none of which run in a straight line, these pools of water that are neither round nor square nor oval nor regular by any measure, all these little pointy specks scattered across the earth that grate on my feet, he was referring to the mountains, look at its shape again, how it is flattened at the poles, how it clumsily revolves around the sun, how its trajectory necessarily eliminates the climates of the poles. To tell the truth, what really makes me think it is uninhabited is that it seems that no one of good sense would want to live here. Well, said Micromegas, maybe the inhabitants of this planet are not possessed of good sense. The thing is, perhaps all this is the way it is for a reason. Everything appears irregular to you here, you say, because everything on Saturn and Jupiter is drawn in straight lines. This might be why you are so puzzled. Have I not told you that I have continually noticed variety in my travels? The Saturnian argued each of these points, and the dispute might never have finished if it were not for Micromegas, who, growing increasingly agitated, had the good fortune to snap the thread of his diamond necklace. The diamonds fell, pretty little carrots of fairly irregular size, of which the largest weighed 400 pounds and the smallest 50. The dwarf recovered some of them, and in doing so, bending down for a better look, he decided to examine how these diamonds were cut with the help of his excellent microscope. So he took out a small microscope of 160 feet in diameter and put it up to his eye, and Micromegas took out another of 2,005 feet in diameter. They were fine instruments, but neither of them could see anything right away and had to be adjusted. At last, the Saturnian saw something elusive that moved in the shallow waters of the Baltic Sea. It was a whale. He carefully picked it up with his little finger and, resting it on the nail of his thumb, showed it to the Syrian, who began laughing once again at the ludicrously small scale of things on our planet. The Saturnian, realising that our world was indeed inhabited, decided without hesitation that it was inhabited only by whales, and as he prided himself on his deductive reasoning, he was determined to infer the origin and evolution of such a small atom, whether it was possessed of intelligence, will, freedom, and so on. Micromegas was confused. He examined the animal very patiently and found no reason to believe that a soul was lodged in it. The two voyagers were therefore inclined to believe that our home planet was a soulless place. Then... With the help of the microscope, they perceived something as large as a whale floating on top of the Baltic Sea. We know that a flock of philosophers was, at this time, returning from the Arctic Circle, where they had made some observations which no one had dared make until then. The Gazettes claimed that their vessel had ran aground off the coast of Bothnia, and that they were having great difficulty setting things straight. But the world never reveals its secrets. I'm going to tell you how it really happened, straightforwardly and without bias, which is no small thing for a historian. Chapter 5 Experiments and Reasonings of the Two Voyages Micromegas slowly reached his hand towards the place where the object had appeared, extended two fingers, and withdrew them for fear of being mistaken, then opened and closed them and skilfully lifted the vessel that carried these fellows, putting it on his fingernail without pressing it too hard for fear of crushing it. "'Here is a very different animal from the first, said the dwarf from Saturn. The Syrian put the so-called animal in the palm of his hand, the passengers and the crew, who believed themselves to have been lifted up by a hurricane, and who thought they were on some sort of boulder, scurried around. The sailors took the barrels of wine, threw them overboard onto Micromega's hand, and then jumped after them. The geometers measured with their quadrants and sextants, assisted by two Lapland girls. They descended onto the Syrian's fingers, where they made so much fuss that he finally felt something move, tickling his fingers. It was a steel-tipped baton being pressed into his index finger. 
He judged by this tickling that it had been spat out by some small animal that he was holding. He did not suspect anything else at first. The microscope, which could barely distinguish a whale from a boat, could not capture anything as elusive as a man. I am not attempting to insult anyone's vanity, but I am obliged to ask that important men make a simple observation. Taking the size of a man to be about five feet, the figure we make upon earth is comparable to that made by an animal of about six hundred thousandths the height of a flea on a ball five feet in diameter. Imagine a being that could hold the earth in its hands, and which has organs in proportion to ours, and it may very well be that there are such things. Conceive, I ask you, what such a being would think of the battles that allow a victor to capture a village, only to lose it later. I do not doubt that if ever some captain of some troop of imposing grenadiers reads this work, he will increase the size of the hats of his troops by at least two feet. Imposing, no question. But I warn him that such actions will have been undertaken in vain, that he and his will never grow any larger than infinitely small. What marvellous skill it must have taken for our philosophers from Sirius merely to perceive the atoms of which I have just spoken. Even Leuvenhoek and Herzogke, tinkering with the first microscopes and observing the cells that make us up, did not make so astonishing a discovery. What pleasure Micromegas felt at seeing these little machines move, examining all their scurrying, following them in their enterprises. He cried out with joy and passed one of his microscopes over to his travelling companion. I see them, they said at the same time. Look how they are carrying loads, stooping, getting up again. So they talked, hands trembling from the pleasure of seeing such new objects, and also from fear of losing them. The Saturnian, moving from excessive incredulity to excessive credulity, even thought he saw them mating. Ah, he said, I have caught nature in the act. But he was fooled by appearances, which happens only too often, whether one is using a microscope or not. Chapter 6 What Happens to Them Among Men? Micromegas, a much better observer than the dwarf, clearly saw that the atoms were speaking to each other, and pointed out, pointed this out to his companion, who, ashamed of being mistaken about them reproducing, did not want to believe that such a creature could communicate. He had the same facility with languages as the Syrian did, and, so as the Syrian, and, unable to hear the atoms talk, supposed, therefore, that they did not speak. After all, how could these impossibly small beings have vocal organs? And even if they did, what could they possibly have to talk about? To speak, one must think, more or less. But if they think, they must therefore have the equivalent of a soul. But to attribute the equivalent of a soul to this species struck him as manifestly absurd. But, said the Syrian, you believed right away that they engaged in the act of love. Do you believe that one can make love without thinking? without speaking a single word, or at least without making oneself heard? And do you suppose that it's harder to produce an argument than an infant? Both appear to be great mysteries to me. I do not dare believe or deny it, said the dwarf. I have no more opinions. We must endeavour first to examine these in insects and to rationalise only after that. That is very well said echoed Micromegas, and he briskly took out a pair of cuticle scissors he had about his person, and from the pairings of his thumbnail he improvised a kind of speaking trumpet, like a vast funnel. He put the end up to his ear. The circumference of the funnel enveloped the vessel and the entire crew. The weakest voice entered into the circular fibres of the nails in such a way that, thanks to the care with which he had constructed it, the philosopher above could hear the buzz of our insect voices perfectly well. In only a few hours he was able to distinguish words, and soon enough to understand French. The dwarf managed to do the same, though with more difficulty. The voyager's amazement increased second by second, for they heard these mites speak moderately intelligently, though such a performance seemed inexplicable to them. You may well believe that the Syrian and the dwarf burned with impatience to converse with the atoms, the dwarf feared that this his thunderous voice, to say nothing of Micromegas' boom, would deafen the mites without being understood, 
they had to diminish its force, and so placed toothpicks in their mouths, whose tapered ends fell around the ship. The Syrian put the dwarf on his knees, and the ship with its crew on a fingernail. He lowered his head and spoke softly. Finally, deploying these precautions and various others, he began to speak. Invisible insects that the hand of the Creator has caused to spring up in the abyss of the infinitely small, I thank him for allowing me to uncover such seemingly impenetrable secrets. Perhaps those at my court would not deign to give you audience, but I mistrust no one, and I offer you my protection. If anyone has ever been surprised, it was the people who heard these words. They could not figure out where the speech was coming from. The chaplain of the vessel recited a prayer for the exorcism of devils, the sailors swore, and the philosophers of the vessel constructed systems. But no matter what systems they came up with, they could not figure out who was talking. The dwarf from Saturn, who had a softer voice than Micromegas, told them in a few words what species they were dealing with. He told them all about the voyage from Saturn, brought them up to speed on what Mr. Micromegas was, and, after lamenting how small they were, asked them if they had always been in this, in this miserable state so near nothingness, and what they were doing on a globe that appeared to belong to whales, whether they were happy, if they reproduced, if they had a soul, and a hundred other questions of this nature. A reasoner among the troop, more daring than the others, and shocked that someone might doubt that he possessed a soul, observed the interlocutor with sight veins pointed at a quarter circle from two different stations, and spoke thusly. You believe then, sir, that because you are a thousand fathoms tall from head to toe, that you are a... A thousand fathoms, cried the dwarf. Good heavens! How could he know my height? A thousand fathoms! You cannot mistake him for a flea. This atom just measured me. He is a surveyor. He knows my size. And I, who can only see him through a microscope, I still, don't do, not, I still do not know his. Yes, I measured you, said the physician, and I will measure your large companion as well. The proposition was accepted. His, excellently, sorry, his excellency laid down flat. He, had he stayed upright, his head would have disappeared into the clouds. Our philosophers planted a great shaft upon him, in a place that Dr. Swift would have named, but that I will restrain myself from calling by its name, out of respect for the ladies. Next, by a series of triangles linked together, they concluded that what they saw was in effect a young man of 120,000 feet. Then Micromega spoke these words. I see more than ever that one must not judge anything by its mere size. O oh God, you have given intelligence a substance that appears contemptible. The infin infinitely small costs you as little as the infinitely large, and if it is possible that there are such small beings as these, there may just as well be a spirit bigger than those of the superb beings that I have met among the stars, whose feet alone would cover this planet. One of the philosophers responded that he could certainly imagine that there are intelligent beings much smaller than man. He recounted not every fabulous thing Virgil says about bees, but what Swammerdam discovered, and what Rimmer has anatomized. He explained, finally, that there are animals that are to bees what bees are to man, what the Syrian himself was for the vast animals that he had spoken of, and what these animal, large animals are to other substances before which they look like atoms. Gradually, the conversation became more interesting, and Micromega spoke as follows. Chapter 7 Conversations with the men. O oh, intelligent atoms, in which the eternal being desires to make manifest his skill and his power, you must no doubt taste pure joys on your planet. For having so little matter, and appearing to be entirely spirit, you must live out your life thinking and loving the true life of the mind. Nowhere have I seen true bliss, but it is here, without a doubt. At this, all the philosophers shook their heads, and one of them, more honest than the others, avowed that, with the exception of a small group of inhabitants held in poor esteem by the others, we are an assembly of mad, vicious, and wretched people. We have more matter than we need, he said, to do evil, if evil comes from matter, and are possessed of too much spirit, if evil comes from spirit. Did you know 
For example, that as I am speaking with you, there are 100,000 madmen of our species wearing hats, killing 100,000 other men wearing turbans, or being massacred by them. And that we have used almost all the surface of the earth for this purpose since time immemorial. The Syrian shuddered, and asked the reason for these horrible quarrels amongst such inconsequential creatures. It is a matter, said the philosopher, of some piles of mud as big as your heel. It is not that any of these millions of men that slit each other's throats care about this pile of mud. It is only a matter of determining if it should belong to a certain man whom we call Sultan, or to another whom we call, for whatever reason, Tsar. Neither one has ever seen nor will ever see the little piece of earth, and almost none of these animals that mutually kill themselves have ever seen the animal for which they kill. Oh, how cruel a fate! cried the Syrian with indignation. Who could conceive of such an excess of insane rage? It makes me want to take three steps and crush this whole anthill of ridiculous murderers. Don't waste your time, one of the humans replied. They are working their own ruin quickly enough. Believe me, in another ten years, only one hundredth of these scoundrels will even be here. Know that, even if they have not drawn swords, hunger, fatigue, or intemperance will overtake them. More to the point... They're not the ones who deserve punishment. It's those sedentary barbarians who, from the depths of their offices, order, while they are digesting their last meal, the massacre of a million men, and who subsequently give solemn thanks to God. The voyager was moved with pity for the small human race, where he was discovering such surprising contrasts. Since you are amongst the small number of wise men, he told his gentlemen, and since... Apparently you do not kill anyone for money. Tell me, I beg of you, what occupies your time? We dissect flies, said the philosopher. We measure lines, we gather figures. We agree with each other on two or three points that we do not understand. The Syrian and the Saturnian were both immediately interested to know what it was they agreed upon. What, what do you measure? said the Saturnian, from the dog star to the great star of the Gemini. They responded all at once. Thirty-two and a half degrees. What do you measure from here to the moon? Sixty radii of the earth, even. How much does your air weigh? He thought he had caught them, but they all told him that air weighed around nine hundred times less than an identical volume of the purest water and nineteen thousand times less than a gold ducat. The little dwarf, from Saturn, surprised at their responses, was tempted to accuse of witchcraft the same people he had refused a soul a mere quarter of an hour earlier. Finally, Micromega said to them, Since you know the exterior world so well, you must know what is interior even better. Tell me what your soul is, and how you form ideas. The philosophers all broke out speaking, everyone clamouring at once, all with different views. The oldest cited Aristotle, another pronounced the name Descartes, this one here Malebranche, another Leibniz, another Locke. An old peripatetic spoke up with confidence. The soul is an entelechy, and a reason gives it the power to be what it is. This is what Aristotle expressly declares on page 633 of the Louvre edition. He cited the passage. I do not understand Greek very well said the giant. Neither do I, said the, the philosophical insect. Why then, the Syrian retorted, are you citing some man named Aristotle in the Greek? Because, replied one savant, one should always cite what one does not understand at all in the language one understands the least. The Cartesian took the floor and said, the soul is a pure spirit that has received in the belly of its mother all metaphysical ideas and which, leaving that place, is obliged to go to school and to learn all over again what it already knew and will not know again. It is not worth the trouble, responded the eight-league tall individual, for your soul to be so knowledgeable in its mother's stomach, only to be so ignorant when you have hair on your chin. But what do you understand of the mind? You are asking me? said the reasoner. I have no idea. We say that it is not matter. But do you at least know what matter is? Certainly, replied the man. For example, this stone is grey, has such and such a form, has three dimensions, is heavy and divisible. Well, said the Syrian, 
This thing that appears to you to be divisible, heavy, and grey, please tell me what it is. You see some attributes, but what about that which is behind those? Can you tell me about that? No, said the other. So you do not know what matter is? So Micromegus, addressing another sage that was balanced on his thumb, asked what his soul was and what it did. Nothing at all, said the Malabrancus philosopher. God does everything for me. I see everything in him. I do everything in him. It is he who does everything that I get mixed up in. It would be just as well to not exist, retorted the sage of Sirius. And you, my friend, he said to a Leibnizian who was there, what is your soul? It is, answered the Leibnizian, the hand of a clock that tells the time while my body chimes out. Or, if you like, it is my soul that chimes out while my body tells the time, or my soul is the mirror of the universe and my body is the border of the mirror. That's all clear. A miniature follower of Locke was nearby, and when he was finally given the floor, he said, I do not know, said he, how I think, but I know that I have only ever thought through my senses, that there are immaterial and intelligent substances I do not doubt, but that it is impossible for God to communicate thought to matter I doubt very much. I revere the eternal power. It is not my place to limit it. I affirm nothing, and content myself with believing that many more things are possible than one would think. The being from Sirius smiled. He did not find this the least bit sage, while the dwarf from Saturn would have kissed the follower of Locke, were it not for the extreme disproportion of their respective sizes. But there was, alas, a little animacule in, the square, in a square hat who interrupted all the other animalcule philosophers. He said that he knew the true secret and that everything would be found in the summer of St. Thomas Aquinas. He looked the two celestial inhabitants up and down. He argued that their people, their worlds, their suns, their stars had all been made uniquely for mankind. At this speech, our two voyagers nearly fell over with that inextinguishable laughter which, according to Homer, is shared with the gods. Their shoulders and their stomachs heaved up and down, and in these convulsions the vessel that the Syrian had on his thumbnail fell into one of the Saturnian's trouser pockets. These two good men searched for it for a long time, found it finally, and tidied it up neatly. The Syrian resumed his discussion with the little mites. He spoke to them with great kindness, although in the depths of his heart he was a little angry that the infinitely small had, it seemed, an almost infinitely large pride. He promised to make them a beautiful philosophical book, written very small for their convenience, and said that in this book they would see the point of everything. And indeed, he gave them this book before leaving. It was taken to the Academy of Sciences in Paris, but when the ancient secretary opened it, he saw nothing but blank pages. Ah, he said, I suspected as much. But um, and that brings us to the end of Micromegas by Voltaire and tonight's reading. Thank you very much for listening.